What's up, everybody? My name is Mark Raymond Jr., and I am the CEO and founder of Split Second Foundation, an organization in New Orleans that does a lot for the disabled community. And this is my story. Okay, so tell everyone, I'm like, where are you from? I'm from Seven Ward. Born and raised. Seven Ward, New Orleans. Uh, I like, went to Brother Martin for high school, then Xavier for college, got a degree in chemistry uh, with a lot of concentration in physics and biology. Ended up working in television for a long time uh, up until my accident happened. Okay. Well, you know, if, if we're going to jump into the, uh, if we're going to jump into that, I'm like a little later on, but we're going to start on like being from the Seven Ward, going to, you know, school. Going to college, like I want to know, on uh, what your or like actually, what is your I mean, experience being from New Orleans has been? Man, New Orleans is a crazy city, right? So going to Brother Martin for high school, wasn't a lot of black kids there, um, and then transitioning and going to Xavier for college, and it's all black everything. I had two like unique experiences, so I was tapping into you know, two different friend groups, to be honest. I had my, all of my, my high school relationships and friends, and then I had my, my Xavier relationships and friends. Um, and that, to me, that that's like my New Orleans experience, you know what I'm saying? Being able to like, now cross consumer bases uh, because of those relationships and being able to go anywhere and talk to anybody, you know what I mean? I can go to the hood, I'm good in the hood, or I can go to the White House. Or you, go, or you can actually I'm like, go to the bank. Or I can go to the bank. <laughs> I like to go to the bank. So, brother, more not like, you just actually made me realize that I'm like, man, I only knew growing up, if like two black guys actually went to brother more, See? and that was DJ and Brock. Right. <laughs> I was like, so I DJ, didn't realize that. DJ was my year. Katrina kind of messed all that up for yeah, us. Yeah, I graduated from Katrina. Yeah, 06. 05. I was I was oh six. Yeah, I graduated. Oh five oh six was like my senior year. Okay. So <laughs> Yeah you know I'm saying, like it went in a straight chaos mode. But that was my first like real experience with adversity in life. Right? Like we had storms before but You had to leave. We, we had to not just leave, like like rebuild and you know like reset life. That's that's why that transition was like because you had to go to a brand new high school for a while. We went to Brother Martin Night School in Baton Rouge. So oh. we was going to school Sunday through Thursday from like 3.30 to 9.30. Wow. I didn't Thursday, that. Thursday yeah. at 9.30 started my Friday night, right? Like, down the street. Oh, so you went to Baton Rouge street. for the hurricane? Uh-huh. Dang. Brother Martin opened a night school at Catholic High. It, it was just... <laughs> it, it, all right. Hey, but then man, this school stay open, up. Huh? Yeah. Any kind of way, huh? Oh, you already know. All of them did. I mean, it was trying to. And then we came back uh, that January... The city was all devastated. I, like, it was wild. Being down here and everything was pitch black. You know what I'm saying? You go out at night, like, you know, we in high school, so they had a few little the little hangouts for us. Like, and so you have seen, like, a lot in your life, huh? Oh, yeah. Like, you had to transition twice, and like, yeah. for something big, like, for the Hurricane Katrina and the pandemic. Yeah. So that well, was... The, the pandemic was an easier reset. The bigger reset for me was, like, the accident. Right, like the the hurricane probably prepared me for the reset that I had to take after being like wheelchair bound. Okay, so we're gonna jump into it, like you know, and for the people who, for the people who probably haven't on the heard your story, can you can you kind of like explain what happened? Yeah, so July fourth, twenty sixteen, I was out on a out on a lake with a bunch of my friends. Uh, my buddy Lance was playing for the Knicks at the time. Um, so we, we took the boats out, was hanging out, it was like right after Essence weekend. So it was, it was the Monday after Essence weekend, like perfect kind of chill way to just close out that whole little party weekend. And, um, man, dude got a call from his agent, like saying that he got a, a four year contract extension and my happy, excited ass took three steps off the, and jumped off the back of the boat and broke my neck not paying attention to um, the depth of the water at that time, right? Because like, the water gets shallower as the day goes on, tide changes. Um, 
So I drowned and broke my neck. They had to resuscitate me, rush me back to the marina. Uh, so I actually lost my pulse like I think three or four times in that process before they got me to the hospital and stabilized. Um, once I got to the hospital, I think I was coherent somewhat. I really don't remember. Uh, but pneumonia set in, so they had to put me in an induced coma. So I was in a coma for like two and a half weeks while I fought the pneumonia. Um, it was, from what I hear from my family and friends, kind of touch and go. But uh, but I pulled through, and when I woke up, doctors was like, "Yo, you uh, you have a spinal cord injury, and you're paralyzed right now from like your chest down." Um, I was on a ventilator. Um, I had tubes coming out of the side of my chest because one of my lungs collapsed. I had a feeding tube on my other side. It was like, I felt like I was in the matrix. You know what I mean? It was, it was wild. But, um, like my initial reaction was denial, right? I'm hearing doctors telling me I'm never going to walk. I'm never going to do something again. You're like, yeah, all right. You know, that ain't. No, nah, ain't, ain't no way. You know, and so every day, like, I remember being in, like, the ICU in the hospital. I'd try to move my legs and move my toes, you know. And uh, every day, like, nothing would move. Um, and it'd be so demoralizing, you know. So, and I tell everybody, like, you know, when you're dealing with that level of trauma and grief, um, it's challenging. So I was blessed to have a great family and support system that could take care of the business side of you know my health care and you know make sure that 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 all of the dot the eyes were being dotted the t's were being crossed um i went i ended up at Turo for my inpatient rehab stay right i was there for six weeks and that's where they kind of you know really teach you how to live a life in a in a chair or get around and um somewhat be independent, learn how to dress yourself. Um, and that experience kind of opened my eyes to the lack of resources in the community, specifically like when I got discharged from Turo, it, it was like, I went from having all this access to doctors and nurses and therapists around the clock, counselors, um, to that whole responsibility being on my family, right? To help me with getting up, getting dressed, you know, eating, like, so it was, um, it was a, it was a major reset for me, and I didn't initially adapt well, there wasn't a place in the community, like, what we've built, where people could go and see other people, learn from their experience, talk to their, their caregivers, and, um, I think that isolation, you know what I'm saying, really fueled, like, my depression that first year after, and just like dealing with any other type of grief, like, you know what I'm saying? You, you, you lose a loved one, like every, every holiday or every day that you really spent with that person that was ingrained in your membrane, it was, is now a challenge, right? So my birthday, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Mardi Gras, right? Every holiday that rolled around, every major like milestone within that calendar year was just tough. You know what I'm saying? Cause I'm watching my friends doing stuff I want to do or thinking about, you know, it's Friday night. Normally I'd be at work, you know, in Minnesota or somewhere doing a fight. Let me call my crew, talk to them for 10 minutes. And you know what I mean? Like, so it was a lot of, a lot of like depression management at that time and trying to wrap my head around everything. Inevitably I had to leave New Orleans. Uh, so I left July 7th. 2017 and just get away from everything. I went to California, to Sacramento, California, and participated in this program called SCI Fit. It was like, it was like a gym for people like me, right? First day I get there, open the door, everybody in the room says hello. So I'm like, this remind me of home, right? Uh, look around and it's a bunch of empty wheelchairs and people walking, doing stuff that doctors were telling me I'd never do. And like the doctrine from or the way this facility operated they just want to challenge the norm of what recovery looked like post paralysis or stroke or from any of these situations by constantly doing physical exercise and uh and 
and monitoring your functional return, right? Um, so while I, I spent, I ended up spending three months there and I felt stronger when I got back than I had doing like a whole year of therapy here just because I was pushing it like that much harder and had people around me that wanted to push. Um, it was at that place that I really started to formulate the ideas of creating an organization that could do work like that in New Orleans. And um, he, I, like, like you know, I'm, I'm going to work out every day, but I'm taking a little mental notes on things that I think I could implement there, right? Like they had a real community vibe, you know? So it was beyond the physical fitness um, outcomes that you would see, right? Like it was, it was emotional well-being. It was mental health. It was spiritual health. You know what I'm saying? Being around a bunch of people who, like you, were trying to push through. You know what I'm saying? Some of the, the hardest situations uh, in life, and um, and and that's I think what we've been able to build and create from uh, as Split Second Foundation over the past four years. Um, so, so I get back October 2017 with like this idea, right? I had no idea how to start a nonprofit, how to run a business like this. Uh, I started meeting with other advisors and people who had done it to kind of see what their process was, uh, how did how do we get funding, yada yada yada. Ended up finally filing the paperwork in April of 2018. I knew I could do one thing well, and that was network and throw fundraisers to raise, you know, capital to get monies for the operations of the organization, right? So three months after we get the paperwork, we're throwing our first fundraiser. Uh, we did it at the McKenna Museum and ended up raising like $40,000 40 or $50,000. Uh, took that money, put it in a bank, went and did a whole bunch of development courses, leadership courses, um... I put, I went through the Propeller Startup Incubator so I can get a better understanding of like, you know, what's a good mission statement, a vision statement, what are the goals of the organization, program development, what are the different like pillars of a business like this needs to stand on and it's marketing and communications and having good financials, filing all your, your, your tax returns the right way, but also framing your solutions around impact and community impact, right? Um, and so coming out of that program, I I, I, I got the mission to uh, break barriers for people with disabilities more broadly, right? When I was first framing my thought process on how do I create this, it was like all spinal cord injury. It was specific to my experience. Going through that, I learned about individuals with stroke and how many stroke patients you know we see in Louisiana every day because of our diets. I like to smoke and drink, right? Um, we also do more diabetic amputations than any other state in the country. Um, and quite frankly, most places in the world, right? And it's, it's black and brown people that are really being affected by diabetes disproportionately because of the lack of access to healthcare or understanding of the preventative measures, right, to reduce that that risk of amputation. And so now getting into like that line of work too and framing the whole thought process around this organization, holistically tackling barriers that face people with disabilities um, was super important. So now with the idea of like the fitness program being the first thing to address a simple problem. There's no place for people to go after they get discharged from outpatient therapy. A physical therapist is going to discharge you. They're going to print out a nice piece of paper and tell you, go home and do these exercises, right? For most people with more severe physical disabilities, they can't just do it by themselves, right? So we created a safe environment at Split Second Fitness for people to go and continue their recovery journey while also challenging the traditional doctrine of what recovery looks like post stroke, spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, amputation, and even living with other neurological conditions like cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, um, 
multiple sclerosis, right? Like we are we are the community side of the continuum of care now. Um, and that's just one program, right? When I think about what that program is producing, right? The impacts and the outcomes, providing people that space to go and have that space as a continued resource. We're seeing the physical outcomes, right? The reduced spasticity for folks, uh, better cardiovascular health, less emergency room visits. But we're also seeing those community impact metrics, right? Better emotional stability, better mental health, uh, increased quality of life because now you're happier. You're around people that understand you, get your experience, and can also be your friends and a part of your network, right? Um, so that, I think, has been the most um, impactful part of the work, right? Seeing people really um, making the space their, like, their home, right? It's like a home away from home for most people. But also, like, not after building this, I have had board members who have referred their friends who have had strokes, and now they got friends participating in our program, right? And family members and... You know, I tell everybody, anybody's life can change in a split second. Like, I want you to have better access to resources than I did. That's why we did this. Um, and being able to get people back to a good quality of life faster. Um, that I think that's the biggest impact and outcome that, that we've seen. I just talked for like 15 minutes, so I know you got a question. <laughs> well, you kind of answered a few of them because I was going to ask you like, you know, like what was the like, mental process of it? Because you know, like you know, but I have a few friends that had that actually lost arms and like you know legs from getting shot and everything. Mm -hmm. And like a few of them just didn't want to live anymore. Mm -hmm. Like just that whole process after waking up, like trying to take the tubes out you because you don't know, like I don't want to be here no more. Like right. like I'm used to walking and like living my life how you know it was just every day how you know it was just how you knew. So like. I tell everybody, it's like you live in darkness while you're dealing with that grief and that depression and trying to wrap your head around what happened to you, right? And for me, I found my light in California. And now we try to give other people that light by, you know, what we do. The biggest thing is hope. Like people, I think, lose sight of how powerful hope is. Right. right? So like, do you think like, like... And like a whole other process of being in, being 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 like in a chair. Do you think like most people should actually go onto like therapy for you know, like like a mental health? Yeah, for the mental health. Yes, absolutely. And I, I I think it needs to be coupled right. Like our approach to mental health isn't just a focus on the past, but also the future, right? Like you need you need mental health and life coaching together. You know what I'm saying? It, not everything. You're not going to be able to solve yesterday's problems. You're solving yesterday's problems so you don't do it again in the future, right? But you also need, like, sometimes a guide to help you walk down that path, right? We, we got to keep putting one foot in front of the other. That, that shit is tricky some days when you feel like your life ain't worth living. So, you know, you and your foundation has been in New Orleans and just, you know, changing on like street names and everything like that. Like, oh, that's a whole different bucket. Tell us, how did you even like get into that? Oh, the street name thing was something separate. Um, that was me feeling helpless during the George Floyd uh, protesting space. Okay. And so my thought process was, I can't get out and protest because I'm immunocompromised. You know, I, my lungs don't work right. Um, what can I do to make a change in my community, though, that reflects that we aren't going to continue to live with these systems of white supremacy uh, hovering over us, right? And a realization that is so innate in us that it's cosmetic. Right, like we we ride down Robert E. Lee Boulevard every day, and and we're okay with that, you know. We riding down Jefferson Davis Parkway every day. We we had a monument to Robert E. Lee sitting over the city for almost a hundred years, right? Um, that 
it made sense to me to attack that first. Other people were attacking the criminal justice system. I wanted to just tackle what are our kids going to grow up and who are they going to see reflected on our landscape, right? Because that's a way of honoring somebody. Right. And I didn't feel like them people was worth honoring. So and The crazy part is about being in New Orleans, a lot of kids don't even know, like, do the research who these guys are. Right. And so they were like, like so, so, and so kind of, I'm like, in a sense, you were like, they don't really care, but like, there's, and there's others like you, like, now nah, we got to change this even for the brand new generation. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think there's a disconnect um, from an education perspective, especially in, like, black youth, um, that intentionality to, like, really want to work, really have ambitions outside of being an athlete or an entertainer. Like, there's so many jobs out here, right? I was just talking about this yesterday. I'm like, I think that New Orleans need this... Need one, need one real on a youth center yeah. and have like a wall full of things you can do without going to college. Because, you know, I think it's both. And because most of these kids want to be music artists, mm-hmm. managers, accounts, like, you know, people start to realize there are, there are other jobs you can be right. behind the scenes that actually makes more money than those who's actually on TV. Exactly. So, you know what I'm saying? The, yeah. <laughs> being the producer, being the director. Um, I've seen a lot of people work their way up in, in the film industry here. Um, screenwriting. But look at social media. Right. I mean, I, you know, I'm looking for a social media person right now. Like, I don't need <laughs> nobody with a degree. I need somebody that knows social media. Right? right? Um, but to that point, too, I think there's other buckets of jobs that they could go after that do require a degree, like architects. I, I know so many architectural firms that are looking for young black architects but there there's a shortage of them right same thing with communications people right people that can write press releases and work as you know in public relations right and like PRs is very needed and people don't even know about that PR just like, marketing is just like right? it's just, it, 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 because it's funny because I always tell my girl I'm like, I'm like Kanye does not have a PR he no. can't have a PR like no PR is not going to let him go on TV and say stuff that like He's a PR, actually, um, he, like, he's a full um, nightmare for a PR. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's definitely, especially for PR teams that want to do good messaging. Right. Um, but, you know, I, I can't speak to Kanye. Right. And I, you know, he on the level. He's too positive. Man, look, <laughs> I don't know, dude. <laughs> he might be playing chess with, with corporations that we ain't even watching the game. You know what I'm saying? Right. We, yeah, we, we don't even know the game. Right. We're on the outside looking at the scoreboard like, oh, man, this dude crazy. And if you're judging no opinions, and we don't have a clue what's going on. I, I, I can't. I get you. So, like, you know, also you were saying during the pandemic after George Floyd was, you know, if his incident and you had, you know, problems already from having an accident. Like, how was the pandemic for you? Cause, like, because, you know, you already have problems like with your lungs and you don't want to be around people because you don't want to catch COVID. So how was it for you? I mean, it was a reset. I spent yeah. a lot of time at home planning and it was perfect. Like, I, not, you know, it, it was times where you get bored. But looking back, like, how many of those times do you actually remember being, like, just flat out bored? Like, I needed that. I think the world needed it. You know what I'm saying? Seeing the world slow down a little bit, I think we got more intentional about relationships. Um, there was more empathy. Right. Yeah, you know. And that. the pandemic actually forced people in relationships too. Well, because you can't go outside. Yeah, pandemic. So the hell you went. <laughs> got a lot of pandemic babies. That's yeah, sure. got a pandemic babies on shit. Um, it forced a lot of people out of relationships too. <laughs> you realize, like, I don't like this person. Yeah. And just imagine them, you know, everything like first. I'm like four weeks. Like it didn't matter if y'all was getting to you still can't leave. Right. Nothing was open. <laughs> Hope you ain't signed a lease together. <laughs> you stuck. Okay, so far as everything you do, tell us what do you enjoy most about it and tell us what you actually I'm like dislike about it. I enjoy helping people. Like I genuinely like making a positive impact on somebody's life, making somebody smile. Me being kind to somebody don't cost me nothing. Me showing love to people don't cost me nothing, right? What I get in return, though, is priceless. 
one of the things that I don't like about it is being so public. Like my life now is very public uh, from the work that I do with RTA, um, being the face of Split Second Foundation, and I think being the face of a larger disability activist movement. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have the same uh, level of privacy anymore. So I have to be super conscious about how I'm presenting myself uh, publicly at all times, right? I can't just go on Instagram and pop off on somebody. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I think that's... And and that really ain't that bad. You know, it's just like managing relationships, just like anything else. But uh, but that's that's the one for me. Okay. So, tell the world... I mean, what's the average day like for you? Wake up, uh, talk to my executive assistant, check on schedule. If I don't have Zoom meetings or an interview... I'm trying to go to the gym to catch a workout or do some kind of strategic planning with them. Uh, but I mean, every day is something like every day I'm doing a, some work for something all day. So tell us, um, you know, I'm like a little bit, I'm like about, I'm like this machine that everyone see that you use and like, you know, the at your foundation. Yeah. So the machine that we use to walk clients, uh, we don't own it yet. It's called an XONR. It's by this company called Exobionics. Uh, they're a publicly traded company that patented this technology. Um, it's super lightweight. It's made for individuals who've had spinal cord injuries or strokes or other neurological deficits that need help with the ambulatory pattern. It's the most intuitive one that I've worked with or seen. Uh, like, i.e., it has sensors that tell you when your gait is shifting too far left or right in each step. Um, it also has a mode that gives you feedback on how much you're, you know, how much work you're doing. Um, but other, I mean, it's a great piece of rehab tech, right? Like being able to get people back up on their feet this year. I mean, y'all saw, might have heard we put one of our clients in it. A young man named uh, Ray Walker, who was in a car accident uh, and was paralyzed from the accident. He also lost his mother and his aunt. And this was the first time that he was, you know, able to walk, you know, uh, in front of a bunch of people. His girlfriend saw it. She was very emotional. But I think that's what, like, more than anything, that piece of technology, like, inspires thought, right? Like, damn. This ain't, this ain't just some stuff you see in a movie, right? It's, it's real, and it's like, moving. If the first time I saw it, I already thought you you was about to become on the Iron Man. I said, man, I like what the hell Mark got on him? Maybe about to start flying. <laughs> That's that might be next, man. Give me, <laughs> give me the flying suit. Hey, call your man Tony Stark up. Yeah, you know, like if this world is exactly filled with. On like a lot of on like technology, so you never know what's about to come in five years. So funny you say that though, because um, in the movie, what's his name was paralyzed from right. waist down after that fall or whatever, and that same technology, right? That exoskeleton tech that right. he had on his legs, like that's what we envision the future of that tech is gonna look like. You know, something that's just wearable that is in tune with your, your, your like your brain will get direct input, and it'll move. He's coming. The biggest misunderstanding, like, with me and my injury, like, nothing is wrong with my body. I damaged that much of my spinal cord. If I could, it's like a microphone, wire, and a speaker. Okay. You can't, you can't hear what's coming out of the speaker, not because the mic broke, or because the speaker broke, because the wire broke. If I fix the wire, I fix my body. So, I have this question, actually, I'm like, before we leave, like, if you could take anything back, like, you know, you, you were moving, I'm like, in a different way, actually, before this accident, like, if you could take this accident back, like, do you think you would actually still, actually, I'm like, do the things you actually do right now? If I, like, actually, before the accident, like, you know, like, like, for the George Floyd changing the streets, no, for the foundation, do you think you'll still be going, I'm like, in this, I'm like, direction? So my great grandfather was AP Tour. I think I've constantly tried to figure out how to be engaged in civic duties and 
like be a change agent in the community. I do think that I would have found my footing in that eventually. Um, but I think my accident forced me to, right? It was like one of those um, uncomfortable situations that forced you to evolve. And we talk about like diamonds, right? It takes a long time, pressure, and heat to create a diamond. And um, that adversity is how I feel about my experience. Would I take it back? Would I not jump if I had a choice? Probably. Do I regret it? No. I think it's it's made me into the person that I am today and given me a, a higher level of empathy and understanding uh, and quite frankly, a will to want to make the world better. Gotcha. So tell us, all right, what's next for you? What's next? Uh, I want the second foundation to be a national organization. Uh, so we're really pushing forward in that and scaling our impact. I want to spread my wings to, you know, be a statewide agency first. Um, man, we want to get into accessible housing because there's a huge accessible and affordable housing shortage. Uh, so, you know, getting into that developer space, I think that's a big lane for me. Um, transportation is, is tricky. I'm on the RTA board right now, but there's still just such a lack of accessible transportation nationwide. Uh, for example, when I fly to another city, I can't just go to Avis and rent a wheelchair accessible van. They don't carry them. Right. So that's a policy change. So doing policy advocacy work. Um, but also probably public speaking and, you know, consulting, helping other people start businesses and understand how to make impact in community. I really want to get into a space, too, where I can inspire kids, um, especially young black kids, to see beyond just the the traditional lanes that they um, glorify, right, the okay. athletics or, or entertainment. I think there's, you know, it's, I just see so many jobs out here that, that young black people could do if they knew how to communicate properly and tap into some of these other relationships, right? Um, yeah. Correct. All right. And also, oh, but last but not least, tell everyone, I'm like, what can you find on social media and just everywhere? Yeah. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram. That's probably the platform I use the most. My handle is Mark Raymond Jr. No underscores no nothing uh our website is splitsecondfoundation.org so if you know somebody who's had a stroke or spinal cord injury or recovering from a gunshot wound please direct them to us so we can help get them resources and get them in our programs um yeah that's it shoot me an email mark at splitsecondfoundation.org all right we done and also oh but that's your story that's my story and I'm sticking to it.